Well, good morning. It's good to be here with you all worshiping uh, our Lord together. Uh, we're excited to have some elementary kids' classes available again uh, today during worship. They'll be dis- I'll be dismissing them uh, right before the sermon, and so uh, glad to have some of those families back with us. If you're visiting with us, there should be a Connect card in front of you on the, on the back of the seats in front of you. We would love to uh, just find out a little bit more about you, I'll let you know a little bit about Safe Harbor, answer any questions you may have. So if you want to fill out one of these cards, you can stick it in the offering plate on your way out. They're on the tables in the, in the foyer. We, we would love to touch base with you. We're so glad you came and joined us for worship this morning. Uh, what we like to do here at Safe Harbor to start our time of worship is to read uh, God's Word, read a scripture passage that's related to uh, the sermon that we're going to be hearing later. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans 5, uh, verses 18 through 19, or you can follow along on the, the screens with us as well. And let me read that for us together this morning. Starting in verse 18 of Romans 5, it says this, So then, as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone, so also... Through one righteous act, there is justification leading to life for everyone. For just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so also through one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. And this is the good news that we are going to hear today, that we're going to see in Genesis 3 how sin came into the world uh, through the, the sin of Adam and Eve and how it all began and, and how we see the effects of that even today. But we're also going to see the the good news of God's word and how God addresses that that sin that sins through the the one righteous man, his son, Jesus Christ, and how that brings hope to each one of us in spite of our own sins and our own failures and the sins we see around us. And so this is a a hard message because it makes us come face to face with the reality of our own lives, our own sins, and how we fall short of God and his standard. But also it's a hopeful message that we can have hope even in spite of our sins. And so uh, we're going to pray and open up our time together and begin worshiping our Lord, the the God that we believe is worthy of our worship and our lives and everything about us. So let's pray together. Father, we uh, come before you humbly. Just as we have read and have seen and been reminded that through Adam, through Eve, through their sin, Now we all have sin in our life, Lord. That is a humbling reality that we live with. And yet we know that this reality is not without hope, Father, because of you. Because of your great love for us and sending your son to reconcile us back to you. To forgive our sins. To give us hope of a life without sin that one day we will experience in eternity. And so, Father, as we think today about how sin came into the world, how sin comes into our life, may you give us wisdom and may you give us a love for you that wants to honor you and glorify you because of who you are, God. And may we worship you with that in mind today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with us, please. Let's worship. Let's send this out as a gospel call an encouragement for us church come all you weary come all you thirsty come to the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy, taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for.
Good morning. Welcome to Safe Harbor this morning, and uh, just glad to see all of you all this morning, and what a blessing it is to gather together, and if you're watching uh, online, uh, we're glad you joined us there too, uh, but what a blessing it is to be able to sing the gospel this morning, and to hear it read from God's word, and to hear it preached as well. So uh, this morning, uh, Andy's going to be preaching from Genesis chapter 3, um, starting in verse 1. And if you know anything about Genesis, this is uh, the fall. This is where we start to see sin entering the world. But fortunately, that's not the end of the story uh, because Jesus came to save us from ourselves. So if you have your Bibles, follow along or you can read along on the screen. Genesis chapter 1, or chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Hear God speak through his perfect and holy word this morning. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we're able to hear your word in our own language this morning. We thank you even for this story, which is so sad, that you gave us what we needed, that you gave us everything that we needed to live our lives honoring you. But we chose sin. We wanted more. We wanted to be like you. And we all want that, Lord. We all want more. Unfortunately, we have all sinned and fallen short. But Lord, you decided that you did not want to leave us there. Your plan from the beginning was knowing that you would give us what we need and we would choose more, but you sent your son to save us, to redeem us, to live the perfect life that we chose not to live, to die for the sins that he did not commit, but that we did. And Lord, he offers us his righteousness if we will turn away from our sinful lives and trust in him, follow him. So this morning, Lord, I pray that uh, as we study from Genesis chapter 3 and we realize that the world is broken and we know why, it's because of sin, that we know that there is still hope. No matter where we are in our lives, no matter how hopeless it seems to be, no matter how broken the world seems to be, there is hope in your Son, Jesus Christ, because of your grace, because of your love for the world. Lord, we love you this morning, and we thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. 
indeed. You may be seated. At this time, uh, if, the, if you have an elementary age child and they would like to go downstairs, they can make their way out the back. Make sure you put on your mask. We're asking the children to wear masks right now uh, with the virus going on, but uh, we're glad to be able to offer those classes of, uh, to your kids if they would like to go. If you have your Bibles, just leave them open to Genesis chapter 3. What we like to do here is just work our way through God's Word together. We, we believe God has uh, what we need. His words are what we need. You all don't need my words. Uh, you don't need my opinions, but we do need to hear from what God has to say. And so we are in a sermon series in the book of Genesis. And we're starting at the beginning of the Bible because we believe that the Bible, the book of Genesis, has so many foundational truths uh, that go all the way back to who we, met, who we were when God made us and who the world, what the world was when God made the world. And we've already seen that in a lot of different ways. And we've seen how God created the world uh, to be perfect. And it was a good and perfect world at the very beginning of all things. And yet today, as we just saw, as we just read, we're going to see kind of what went wrong. And we, uh, I think, can, can admit in the year 2020, there was a lot wrong in the world. And I don't have to tell you that. I mean, there's now this running joke of, well, 2020, whatever, right? Because that's just, we know the world is messed up right now. And this is one of the most important chapters, really, in all of Scripture. Because it really gets to the heart of our own lives. Because as much as we look around us and we see the world is messed up, we also know our lives are kind of messed up. Like, there's, there's things in our lives that we just feel like things aren't the way they should be. Uh, we know that we have done things in our own life. We have sinned in ways against other people. We've hurt people. Other people have hurt us. And so we see here in Genesis 3 how all that comes about. It, it all traces back to this one thing that now we inherit and how we went from a perfect world to a world full of anger and murder and heartache and alienation from God. And that's what we're going to see here in Genesis 3. And we're going to see why the world is the way it is. But get this. God wants us to understand this. He wants us to understand how the world works, not just so that we can point fingers and be like, well, that's why it happened. No, he, he's telling us why the world is this way so that we would want him, so we would see our need for him. Because this is a reality that we can't fix ourselves. We Only God can fix it in our lives. And it comes, so this is an invitation. The fall of man, the, the first sin in the world, is an invitation to you and I to believe God and trust him with our lives. And so if you're taking notes, uh, I want you to, to, to write down kind of the main point, and that is this. The, the first sin reveals how Satan wants to tempt us and the importance of knowing God. That's really what this whole chapter is about. God wants us to, to be prepared to understand how Satan wants to tempt you and I and get us to, to dis disregard God and, and disobey God so that then we would know that we need to know God more. If, if we know how Satan wants to tempt us, there's certain things that we need to focus on about who God is to fight those temptations. So Satan, the devil, his goal has always been for us to have a wrong idea about who God is, uh, to, to believe lies about God so that we wouldn't listen to God and that we wouldn't do what God says. And the answer to, to lies, as always, is what? It's the truth, right? What, how, how do we know uh, what things are, are around us and if things are right or wrong? It's the truth. And we know, we believe steadfastly that God is truth. And so what God says is what we need to be believing and not the lies that we're hearing in our heads or from other people. And so what temptations are you facing today? What things in your life do you know, man, my life is not right in this area? Maybe you have some, some anger with other people or anger with situations in your life, unforgiveness, worry. That worry's a big thing these days. Fear, uh, sexual sin, pornography, selfishness, right? You, you feel the weight of those things right now. You, you feel, you come here today, we all come 
here today with something in our life that is just a burden. And maybe we've been carrying it a long time. Well, what we need to see here today is that God has the answer for what has caused those burdens and how we can find freedom from those burdens of our sins. And so I want us to just jump in, and we're going to see really four ways that that Satan tries to tempt us to sin, the the things he wants us to believe, and how we can find uh, freedom from those things in knowing God. So the first thing we see here in, in Genesis 3 is that we can overcome temptation by knowing God's word is complete and authoritative. We can overcome temptation by knowing God's word is complete and, and authoritative. Let's see how sin starts. All right, start. look at verse 1. Let's read that together. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Those four words, did God really say is a direct attack on what God has said, right? Uh, God's words. Now, we're not told here immediately who the serpent is. And some of us, maybe for the first time, if we read our Bible, we're like, what? There's a talking snake here, right? This is weird. But later on, we know as we keep reading the Bible, the Bible helps us understand the rest of the Bible. Uh, And so we find out that this serpent is actually Satan. It's the devil. It's a fallen angel who is uh, the enemy of God. And he has come into this world. We're not told how he got there, but he has come into this world, and he wants to disrupt what God has done. He wants to cause God's creation to rebel against God. And so the first tactic we see here is that Satan tempts Adam, or he tempts Eve, but actually Adam, we find out, is right there next to Eve. And he comes and he questions God's word. He deliberately misquotes what God has said. If you, if you read that, uh, we see that, that Satan said, did God really say you can't eat from any tree? In reality, what God had told Adam back in Genesis 2 was that they could eat from any tree except one. And so this is a deliberate misquoting as Satan wants to prompt Eve to, to doubt what God has said. And Eve responds in verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden. But about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it, or you will die. So Eve responds, everything looks good. No, this is what God really said, except it wasn't what God really said. Satan questions God's word, but what Eve does is add to God's word. She she says, not only can you not eat it, you can't touch it. And that's not what God said. God just said you can't eat it and so eve is getting in this dialogue with satan who's wanting to tempt her to doubt god and she's misquoting what god has said what we have here is eve is the first legalist what does that mean well she's the first person to try to add to god's word she's trying to to make god a little more restrictive than he really was and and so there's this doubt in her mind already well maybe god is is restricting me in some way and let me, let me just say, sometimes we need in our lives to put up boundaries, don't we? Uh, it, it, with people around us, maybe that are bad influences, uh, we need to like guard those relationships a little bit, not, not put ourselves in places where we're going to be tempted to, to, to do what they do, or uh, conversations with people, or if we know, hey, we have a certain temptation to a, a sin, we're not, to, to get drunk, we're not going to go to bars, right? There's a, there's a, a fence there, a boundary. Well, That's what we see Eve doing, but the problem comes when we make these boundaries equivalent to what God says, and then we try to impose them on other people and hold them to it as well. That's exactly what the Pharisees did in the New Testament. They made up a bunch of rules to try to follow God, and they made it equal to what God said they actually needed to do. And what this does is it taints God in his grace that he gives by making God even more restrictive. We see churches today that do that. You have to... to, do things their way. You have to sing certain songs or dress a certain way or you're not really following God. You're not doing it like you should be, even though God doesn't really say anything about that in his word. And so we see Eve is adding to God's word. But what's the danger with that, really? What's the danger with adding to God's word? And it's this. 
when we think that we can make things uh, that help God out or help God do and, uh, or help us follow God the way we should, we are basically saying that God's word, God's instructions are open to our own modification of it. Now, okay, God is true, yes, but also this, we're saying God's word is not enough. God's word needs more added to it. And so Eve is undermining what God says as if what he said is not enough. And she elevates her, her own authority and equates herself to God in a certain way. All this reveals, well, why do we talk about this? Why, why is this important? Well, it reveals that we really do need to know what God says and be careful that we go by what he says and not what any person says. Because God's word is what carries ultimate authority. It's essential if we're going to have spiritual victory. We have to know what God actually says about the things that we're hearing and thinking in our life. God calls every person who says they follow Jesus to trust his word and to live by what his word actually says. So how many of us grew up in church and we still don't really even know most of the Bible? We hear stories, we hear things here and there, little clips. Well, we couldn't really tell you much about the Bible at all. Maybe a few major, major stories and that's it. We're undermining the authority of what God really says. We're saying, God, yeah, you said it, but I don't really need it. I can live without knowing what you said throughout the whole Bible. And this is why it should be a lifelong journey of us who follow Jesus to want to know what God said. Because we know the danger of not knowing. We see it right here. We misquote it. We get misled. And we, ultimately, we want to add to it ourselves and make it what we want. And so we see God's word is essential. Do you believe that? Do you believe you really need to know what God says? There's millions of churchgoers uh, here in the United States even, people who say they're Christians but don't really care enough about what God says to open their Bibles, much less to try to study it and spend time just thinking on who God is. And what we see here is God never intended. God wants us to live by what he says. We need it desperately. God's word in the New Testament, we're told, is living and active. What this means is that when we read God's word, his spirit brings us to life. God's word works in us to create life, to, to give us what we really need to know and to make us like him. And that's what we see. We overcome sin and temptation by letting God work in our lives through his living word. And bringing life to us. That's the first thing we see. That we need to know if we're going to overcome temptation. It starts with knowing what God actually says. Then we see another temptation here. That Satan brings to Adam and Eve. That we need to, to be aware of. Second point we see. Is that we overcome temptation. By knowing that God. Is trustworthy and true. Alright so we overcome temptation by God's word. But we don't just stop with knowing what God has said. We actually believe it's true. And believe we can trust it. We can hold to it and believe that what God says is true now and forever. God is a God of truth. And what he says never changes. He's always the same. So let's look at verse 4. No, Satan says, you will, not, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. So Eve has responded to the serpent, right? That don't, don't eat it or touch it or you will die. And now the serpent says, no, you won't die. What this is doing, the serpent is just directly calling God a liar. What God said actually isn't true. And he wants them, he wants Eve to doubt God's judgment. To doubt the consequences that he said would happen. You won't die means, hey, the consequences of not doing what God said aren't that bad. Because what God said is not really true. You're actually going to get more benefit. Uh, than harm from disregarding God's instructions. In a sense, he's right. They don't immediately physically die. They live hundreds more hundreds of more years. But ultimately, it does bring death. It brings physical death. And as we'll see next week, it almost immediately brings spiritual death. There is a, a sense that their knowledge of God, their relationship with God dies in that moment. And so we have to remember, as we see what Satan wants us to do, to doubt the truthfulness of what God says, 
God's word is always true. That should be in the core of our hearts. Satan uses these same tactics on us. He wants us to minimize our sin, to disobey God by thinking, oh, it's not that bad to do what we're doing. He gets us to think, hey, listen, no one else will see you. Nobody else is going to know. What you're doing doesn't really affect anybody else if, as long as they don't know about it. You can always ask for forgiveness later and fix it later, address it later. We hear that a lot, don't we? I don't really go to church now, but I probably will later on in my life. I don't, I don't really spend that much time uh, with knowing the Bible or, or studying the Bible or, or doing the church thing, uh, but I will later on in life. That is a lie that Satan wants us to believe. that We don't really know, need to know the truth of what God says now. We can just kind of put it off and address it later on in our life, hopefully. Well, we, you know, Satan wants us to, to love, to believe. He would love for us to believe that our actions don't really have consequences that are that bad. That's the lie he wants us to believe, especially not eternal consequences, right? No, that there's not really a, a divine judgment that we're going to face. There's not really a hell or accountability to God for every word we speak, for every thought we think, for ac every action we do. Right? This is what the world wants us to believe because Satan wants us to believe it, that there's not really accountability for how we live our lives because God is not really truthful in what he's saying about those things. How often do you hear the phrase that a good God would never send anybody to hell? Like, I, I just can't believe that. Well, that ultimately is a lie that questions God's truthfulness because God has explicitly told us that there are consequences for, for sin it, it, that goes you know, unaccounted for. And, and God's goodness, we have to realize, is not just about his love. God's goodness is also about the fact that God always does what is right and just and good. And God can't just let offenses, sin, go unpunished. That would not be a good God. Who, who, how many of us want to go to a judge and say, Judge, I know my brother killed this lady, but you should just let him go. How many of us, w or uh, this, this guy just killed my brother, just let that, that murderer go? None of us would say that, right? That's not a good judge. That would be a corrupt judge. He can get, just get bought off or something. And it's the same thing about God. God's goodness is encapsulated in the fact that he loves us, but also that he always does what is right. And sin demands a consequence it, it demands it and so we have to sit here and and think about the, the truthfulness of what god has said to eve hey that if you disobey me your sin is serious not because you're any worse than anybody else your sin is serious because it's rebelling against god and that's for each one of us it's not about if we're better than somebody else or if we try to do more things for god than somebody else does it's simply if the fact that if we have any sin we have rebelled against the God who loves us. We are slapping God in the face, the God who loves us, who gave us life and calls us to love him and follow him and worship him with our life. And so the truth about your sin and about my sin is that it is serious. It's so serious that Jesus had to come and give his life. And yet we so often forget the truthfulness of what God says about our sin and we just play it off like, Nah, it's not that big of a deal. I'm just going to do what I want, and I can make up for it later on. And that is the opposite of a Savior who died for you. And so I just pray that God would help us see the truth of what our sin is, what we say about it, and that we would avoid eternal judgment by just trusting in what Jesus has done for us and taking the punishment that we deserve. So don't play games. This is a warning. Don't play games with your sin anymore. Right? The truthfulness of what God says about sin, is it's nothing to joke about. Let, let's work on it. Let's be mindful of it. Let's address it now, and we address it by looking to Jesus and asking him to be our Lord and following him. And so moving on, we see here a, a third reality, a third temptation that Satan wants us to believe. We overcome temptation. By knowing God's goodness and love. All right, so we know God is a God who always does what is right and just and good. And we need to take what he says seriously. We also need to know that God is also loving. Like, look at verse 5. 
In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So listen, Satan is questioning right here God's love for them. He's trying to tell Eve, what God has told you is actually keeping you for something that you should have. So God doesn't really love you. Otherwise, he wouldn't tell you not to do this. And so he's getting Eve to question, does, does God really want my best interest? Does God really want what's best for me? Or should I just kind of do my own thing? And we hear that all the time today. This is why people don't want to step foot in a church building. Because they think that it's going to be oppressive to them. It's going to keep them from having fun, from enjoying life. And all that is just a questioning of God's goodness to them. They think something better is out there than worshiping God and knowing him. Because they think God isn't really that good. And so, listen, Satan wants them to believe. Listen, if you disobey God, if you don't know he says, you're actually going to benefit. You're going to become like God. You're going to be, be able to know good and evil just like he does. And so the heart of the matter here is that Satan plays on the human desire to be like God. The appeal for them was to acquire the same wisdom and to put themselves in God's place, to make judge their own decisions about what's right and wrong. Nobody else has to tell them, hey, you're doing the wrong thing, you're doing the right thing. God doesn't get that right, I get that right. That's what Satan wants them to believe. They get to make up their own rules. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Except it leads to disaster when we make up our own rules, when we think we know what we need to do. This, what Satan is wanting them to do, is to declare independence from God. He wants them to declare an independence from the one who has the right to set the standard and say, no, God, you don't. You don't know what's good. Your standard is not good. Mine is. So I'm going to live like what you said didn't really happen. So Satan is tempting Eve to believe that God's rules are actually keeping good from her. Satan does the same to you. He does the same to me. He wants you to get sidetracked on a falsehood that God is really not that good and he's not worth putting the time in. That you know better about what's going to make you most happy. You know better than God how you need to live, what you need to do today when you go home, what you need to do this week. Sounds so appealing to our flesh. I can follow my heart. We, we, we want that, don't we? Just follow your heart and do what makes you happy. Follow your dreams. Sounds pretty American. Except when it goes against what God says, it's not going to lead to happiness. It's going to lead to tragedy. And we're tempted to believe that God is an inconvenience. So I simply redesign him to my rules. Basically making up my own version of religion. That's what we see all around us. We, we're tempted to ignore what God says in his word and just make up our own rules when it comes to marriage, when it comes to sex, when it comes to possessions or money or anything else. God can't really tell me what to do with those things. I know what's going to make me happy. That's a lie that Satan wants you to believe. Postmodern thinking today says, listen, you get to determine your own reality. You are your own authority. You do what you think is right. And for you, that is right. And what for another person, it may be wrong, but for you, that's right. And nobody should tell you any differently. And that flies in the face of what God says, that he alone is good, and he alone knows what is good for you. Don't believe the lie. Don't make yourself have a self-made religion. That leads to emptiness. That leads to judgment. That leads to life without God. Doubting God's goodness will make you think, hey, if, if, we, if we follow him, it's going to cost too much. We're going to lose out. We're going to have to change something about our life, and it's not worth it. But the Bible tells us that a God of the Bible, a good God, is always worth following, even if it does cost us something. Jesus said, deny yourself and follow me, and then you'll find life. Right? Then you'll find life. And so what we see here is this desire to make God into our image instead of becoming in his image. And listen, if you think God's way is not the best way for your life, you're going to find a way for yourself. And who would you rather trust? 
yourself, knowing your own faults, your own failures, the ways that you've let yourself and others down in the past, would you rather follow that and think that that's really going to lead to the best result? Would you rather follow God, the one who made you, who knows everything about you, knows everything about this world and the way it works? It just makes sense that we would want to trust God's goodness and not our own. And yet, so many times, we don't. And we believe, we say we believe in God, we talk about God a lot, but our real God is ourself. That's the way we live. And the Bible calls this idolatry. We've made ourselves an idol. What we see here in Genesis 3 is a warning. Don't believe the lie that God is not good. Jesus came to show us that God is so good that he's willing to lay down his life so you could know him. Nobody else is going to do that for you. Nobody else is going to pay the price for what you have done in your life and buy your forgiveness with his own blood. Jesus has done that for you because of how good he is. Trust in his goodness, not in your own. So that's what we need to remember when Satan tempts us to, to doubt that following God and what God says is actually going to be for our, our best interest. All right, then we see a fourth thing. Don't believe the lie um, that uh, how things look is what's good. All right, so overcome temptation by knowing that appearances can deceive. Appearances can deceive. Satan appeals to Eve here by appealing to what she sees. Look at verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. Satan's already put that in her mind. Listen, if you eat this, it's going to be good. And then she sees it, and it looks good. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Everything in, e in Eve in that moment felt like this is what I need to do. It just feels right. It feels good. This is what's going to make me happy. And so she ate it. And she, what she did was put her own feelings, her own appearances, her own thoughts over what God actually said. That's what she did in the moment. And how often do we do that in our life? We so often, something happens, something comes up, and we just speak because that's what we feel like we need to say. We just do something because we feel like that's what's going to make us happy. And we don't even think about what God says about it, what the consequences of that is. We just do it because it looks good, it sounds good, it feels good. And Adam was there too because she hands him the piece of fruit and he eats it too. He's just standing there watching, thinking, yeah, this sounds pretty good, so I'm going to do it too. Not doing what he is called to do, to lead. He's just following. Listen, in, in Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible says this. The heart is more deceitful than anything else. So think about your life. The things that you think, man, if I can just do this, I will be happy. Measure that by God's word and then realize my heart has led me to so many wrong places. Because it deceives me. I live in a fallen world. I've inherited what Adam and Eve did. That's in my heart. And if I ignore God and do what I feel like doing, I'm going to be deceived. And I'm going to find out at the end of my life I've missed the truth. I've been pursuing something that I thought was right that actually led to death. This is how so much sin happens in our life. We just disregard God completely, and we do what feels good to us, what feels right, because our hearts have deceived us. In 1 John 2, 15 through 16, John points out how Satan does this for us and, and how he tempts us in this way. Don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he says this, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Sounds a lot like what Eve was thinking there, wasn't it? It looked good. 
It's going to be good for wisdom. It's going to make me smarter, make me better. It's going to make me happy. That's exactly what Satan wants to tempt us with. Satan wants to tempt you with appearances of things that look good, even when they contradict what God says. So how do we gain victory over this? Is there any hope to overcome what looks good to us when it's wrong? First thing we see is we can, we can fight this by intentionally thinking on the things of God. Look at Philippians 4.8. Paul says this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if any moral excellence or anything praiseworthy, dwell on these, meditate on these. Don't think about what looks good. Think about what God says is good. Make that your focus. I'm going to think about what God says and what is good, what is lovely, what is praiseworthy. It's Christ. It's Christ. The one who laid his life down for you to give you forgiveness, to bring you to God who lived perfectly in every way, who modeled what our lives should look like. God's word in his son is what we need to fix our minds on if we're going to avoid the things that look good to us and falling into the the things that cause us to sin. We have to set our minds on Christ. But then having set our minds on those things, we have to then take every thought captive to obey Christ. We can't just... Think about God, because we're still going to have things that pop up in our mind uh, that want us to to go down the wrong path, right? So what do we do when that happens? Well, we we have in mind who Christ is, who he calls us to be, and we stop those thoughts. We take them captive to follow Christ and who is lovely and who who is good. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. When you start to doubt God and his goodness for you, his love for you, the truth of what he says, we take those thoughts captive and we remember Christ who laid his life down for us to prove that God is good and trustworthy and true. It is worth laying those things down to know him and to follow him. Be reminded that what you need most is not what you see. What you need most is what you don't see. Life with God. Living in his presence. Walking by his spirit. Knowing his word. That is what we need most. And as you do that, as you live in his presence, the things of earth, the appearances of earth, will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and his grace. That is how we overcome temptation. When we know his glory and his grace, those things that looked good, Don't look so good anymore. And so Genesis 3 is meant to open your eyes to reality. Satan is doing everything he can to get you to believe lies about who God is, about what God says, and think that you know better. But just like Adam and Eve in the garden, left to yourself, you are not strong enough to overcome this on your own. You cannot. It is impossible. We believe lies because we are fallen human beings. And yet there is good news. This is not without hope. In spite of being the way we are in our sin, inheriting it, the good news is that God has not left us to ourselves to overcome it. He came to us. The rest of the Bible is about God showing how desperate we are for him and the fact that he would come to us in our sin, in our struggles, And walk with us through life when we put our faith in Jesus. When we know that Jesus laid down his life to bring us back to God. And that we don't have to face these temptations alone. And yet so often we live as if we want to do it alone. We just ignore God. We ignore his people. We try to live life figuring it out in our own minds. Ignoring the fact that God came to us so that we wouldn't have to. That we can know his presence. God sent Jesus to forgive you and to be present with you right now in the battle you're facing, in the temptations you're facing. So when Satan comes to tempt you, Jesus offers you the truth that he is better. And how do you know that? It's when you come to see him and see his love for you, see his sacrifice for you, 
and you realize that is what I need more than anything else in my life. I need that Savior. And I need him every day. That is how we overcome temptation in our life. We realize how Satan is tempting us, and we run to the realization of who Jesus is, and we live for him. And then God more and more gives us the ability to overcome temptation with him walking with us through life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you sent your son because of how desperately we need it. That we see here in Genesis 3, the reality for Adam and Eve is the same reality we face every day. These temptations to think that we can live life apart from you. To think that we can make the best decisions for what we want to do. To think that we know what we need most. When, Father, what we need most is what you say. Lord, our hearts deceive us as you have told us, but you bring us truth. Lord, I pray that each one of us today would see that, that we would see our need for your truth, and that we would follow you in what you say. Lord, we thank you for giving us this insight, revealing yourself to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If anybody here knows that they have not been following what God has said. They've been trying to do it your own way. And you have seen your sin firsthand. Know today that God is offering you something better. God has sent his son so that you could know him. Your sin has separated you from him. But Jesus and what he has done on the cross can bring you back to God. Give you freedom and forgiveness before God. And a new life with God. God is offering that to each one of us. If you don't know that, I would love to talk with you some more about that. If, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I would love to introduce you to this Savior so you can know God's presence in the middle, middle of temptation, in the battle you face. For those of us here, maybe you come burdened today with your sin, with your struggles. Know that in the middle of that, Jesus offers life. Turn back to him. Walk with him. Make him your priority. Let's sing. Let's respond to God's word together. And then we'll uh, continue on with our time of worship uh, by doing the Lord's Supper. i
There's something a little bit different for us here, and that is we have prepackaged uh, communion elements. If you didn't get one, there's some in the foyer. You can get one now. But what we want to do is just take a moment to celebrate an ordinance that God has given us called the Lord's Supper. As Christians, we want to constantly be mindful of what Jesus has done and the fact that he has paid the price for our sins. And one of the ways that God has told us to do that, Jesus implemented before he died on the cross, was by observing the Lord's Supper. As we take this uh, supper together, these elements together, we remember the symbolism of what they are. First, we remember that the, the bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for us. He took the punishment for our sins, and that is what the bread symbolizes. Then we see the juice, the cup, that represents the blood spilled to cover our sins before God. Jesus shed his blood to buy your forgiveness. So when we take the Lord's Supper together, what we are doing is we are re, uh, reminding each other of what Jesus has done and how he has brought us back to God. For, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six that as often as we take the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back. And this is not a sad thing. This is a joyous thing that God would do that for us, and that we now have forgiveness and life. We also want to remember as we take the Lord's Supper to prepare ourselves. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven through 28 says, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. So a man should examine himself. In this way, he should eat the bread and drink from the cup. What does this mean? Well, first it means that whoever is a follower of Jesus is invited to take part of this. To, to, to be... Taking it in an unworthy way means that we haven't really said Jesus is our Lord. We don't really believe that. We haven't confessed that with our mouths. And we haven't professed it publicly. For, for those of you who have been putting off baptism, baptism is a, is a call to obey God um, through professing faith by going under the water and showing that Jesus has made us new. And so is there some area in your life that you have not trusted Jesus with? You need to examine those things in your own heart before you take this. And so we would invite any follower of Jesus who has professed faith in baptism or is planning on uh, getting baptized here soon, then you can uh, take uh, part in, in what we're doing uh, in observing the Lord's Supper together. Um, and if you haven't been, been baptized, we're going to have an opportunity in a couple weeks. Um, we're going to have a baptism service. I would love to talk with you about what that means because baptism is a step of obedience to who God calls us to be, to be followers of Jesus and to let the world know that. And one of the ways we do that is through baptism. So come see me afterward. I would love to talk with you about that. So as we take the Lord's Supper, let's remember the gospel that we are proclaiming, the good news of what Jesus has done for us. And let this move us to a greater desire to serve him, to know him, to follow him in our lives. And so we're going to do this together as a church, just as a symbol of the fact that God has brought us together. He has bought us not only as individuals, but as a people. We are brought together from all the different walks of life that we come from, all the different places, all the different backgrounds, to be a people for God because of what Jesus has done. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a song. Uh, he's going to play some music, John is, and then we'll just take some time in your seat. You can sit down. Um, and we're just going to spend a little time in prayer. And then I'm going to close out the prayer time and we'll take these elements together.
So Jesus, with his disciples on the, the night of his arrest, took the, the, the elements, he took the bread, and Jesus gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the covenant that brings you to God. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Join us again and stand and let's sing this last verse in some chorus. Oh, to Jesus I surrender now I feel the same. close out our time of worship a, a couple quick announcements first for the middle school and high school students we're meeting again tonight at the linden's house um and so it'll be at 6 30 at their house we'll have some food and then time of studying the bible and, and spending time together um they'll be outside and we'll be taking proper precautions uh, for that and so hope you can join us tonight for that um also in a couple weeks we're gonna have a men's outdoor kind of bonfire event at the smith's uh property up in corinth so it'll be friday september 25th at 6 30 um Dads, if you want to bring your, your sons, you're welcome to do that. There's going to be hot dogs, um, fire pit, and all that stuff. Or not a fire pit, but a fire, actual fire. Uh, and then we're going to, if you want to fish or something like that, there's a lake there. So you can, so you can uh, bring uh, yourself and any uh, sons or anything like that that you want to bring with you. Uh, also, on the 27th, I mentioned a minute ago that Sunday afternoon, we're going to have an outdoor baptism service. We've got several that um, are ready for baptism we've talked with, and they profess faith in Jesus. And, and we feel like they're ready, and so we're going to baptize them. If you have never been baptized, and that's something that God has put on your heart, I would love to talk with you about that what, that, what that means to follow Jesus, what it means to make that profession of faith through baptism, and take that step of obedience to what God calls you to do as a follower of Jesus. So come see me. would love for you to be a part of this special service if, if God is calling you to be. Um, and so excited about some of these upcoming things. Also excited to introduce to you Ed and Emily Goodman. Y'all can raise your hands over there. Ed and Emily have been visiting uh, for a while now, and they have expressed a desire to become members of this church, um, and so I'm excited to welcome them. It's been a joy to get to know them and spend some time getting to know them, hear their testimony about how they've come to know the Lord and, and following the Lord. Ed's actually um, served in ministry before, and, and uh, so we're glad to, to have him uh, offer those opportunities to, to minister here, and also Emily as well that has been a big part of the churches they've been a part of. She's a meteorologist with LEX 18, and so we're glad to have Ed and Emily uh, here as part of our church family and looking forward to seeing how God is going to use you guys uh, here. And so one thing about our church is we, uh, as a congregation, 
uh, affirm who is a part of our body. We welcome one another and affirm one another in our, upon our testimony of faith. And so uh, all the members of our church, if you would like to uh, welcome Ed and Emily as part of our covenant membership of our church family, please, please write, say your right hand and say amen. Amen. Any pose? Nope. Okay. That's good. And so, guys, welcome. We're thrilled to have you all here at, at Safe Harbor. And so afterwards, let me just encourage you all to, to go and say a word, introduce yourself from a socially distant, safe uh, distance. Uh, you can do that. But i um, excited to see uh, how God is going to use them here in our church family and looking forward to partnering together. As we close out, let me just read from, us, from Revelation 12, verses 9 through 10. It says this. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil, and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come, because the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been thrown down. And friends, if we are followers of Jesus, this is our reality, and this will one day come to pass ultimately. We have a Savior who is greater than our enemy. Now let's live life with that Savior as we leave today. Thank you all for worshiping with us. Good to see you.